This is a, an experience report. This is, so this is a personal reflection. Uh, um, all views are expressed on my own. Uh, all historical references are entirely made up, uh, um, particularly anything involving dates. Uh, uh, what else? OK, um, I'm very excited about web development. OK, that's the too long, didn't read version. If you need to get a coffee, you can go now, because that's the whole talk. All right, I'm very excited about web development. Um, I'm uh, got a bit of trepidation with this talk, because this talk involves showing you stuff, showing you things in browsers and that kind of thing, which I don't usually do in talks. So what I've done is I've installed a very expensive device called a Scott Hanselman. And he's, he's, he's sitting in the front row. If anything goes wrong, apparently I just, I just squeal, and it's, it's voice activated. I go, Scott, Scott, it's all good. And he, and he comes rushing out and rescues me. So I'm feeling a lot, I'm feeling OK. Uh, I've got a good feeling about the rest of this. Um, so, OK, uh, I have 50 minutes to do a one hour talk that in the run through was about three hours. So I'll start. Um, the talk was going to be called, well, it's called The Browser is Dead, but that's only because the title slide's really small. It's actually The Browser is Dead, Long Live the Browser. So, OK, who's doing enterprise development, enterprise app stuff? So you're doing web things, but you're doing them. You're not doing them for millions of people. You're doing them for tens of people, or possibly hundreds of people. But those tens or hundreds of people eat in the same canteen as you, OK? And they know your email address. And they know your manager, all right? So you know, that kind of world, not millions of people. Who's, who's doing that enterprise-y? Enterprise right, you lot, you're my audience, OK? Um, there will be no, uh, oh, here's how you scale this to a million people, and here's how you, I, I, I don't do that. I'm not in that world. I've been in the world of enterprise development for about, I don't know, I'm going to say 20 years, um, delivering systems to internal stakeholders. So they're a small captive group of people, and I work with them. So here's the thing. Um, over, you know, since the, since the interweb started, or rather, not since the interweb started, since the World Wide Web started. And it's very important to make a distinction there. The internet has been around for a long time. The World Wide Web, much more recently. We had the browser wars. We had lots of different gangs being different browsers, uh, creating different browsers. And they had their own gang language and their own gang dialects, and they spoke to each other in special ways. So Tim Berners-Lee un unwittingly, unwittingly founded the first gang. I'm fairly sure he didn't realize the scale that the World Wide Web was going to get to. He wrote, uh, he wrote an app called World Wide Web, because he's an academic, and they tend to be quite literal about naming things. Uh, so that's 1990. Um, not, uh, basically, between 1990 and 1993, nothing happens, because like 20 academics are using this thing. But then uh, a group called NCSA produces a browser called Mosaic. And Mosaic's like, it's a, it's a graphical browser, and you can click through things, and you can, you know, the, the internet's linked up, or the World Wide Web's linked up. Next, the following year, Netscape uh, produces Navigator, which is based on Mosaic. It's like trying to turn it into a commercial product. But they, 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 there's, a, there's a weird story here uh, um, that they started off saying, it's going to be free, because all internet software should be free. And then it had like a big asterisk on it. Asterisk, not free, like that. So, but anyway. Um, the following year, Microsoft noticed that the World Wide Web was happening. And they went, oh, we should have an opinion about that. And out came Internet Explorer. So uh, that happened. And then the following year, Opera produced Opera. I'm just putting that there for completeness, really, because both the Opera guys live in Scandinavia. So what, by Opera guys, I mean users of Opera. <laughs> um, and then so there's a lovely quote by Jamie Zawinski. It's uh, Zawinski's Law. Every program attempts to expand until it can read mail. OK? Happened to Emacs, you know? Uh, happened to uh, Netscape Navigator. It grew and grew and grew. How do I add value to my, to my browser? Do I make it a better browser? No. I put an email client in there. Everyone wants one of those. So Netscape Communicator happens. Then nothing happens. Then time passes. OK? And then 2004, the, the new Mozilla Foundation releases a thing called Firefox. Firefox, originally called Firebird, being a reference to a phoenix rising from the ashes of Netscape Navigator. Like, let's just pull the browser out, the thing that we thought was cool, and, and redo that. So there's a big gap here. And then, again, a few years after that, Google produced Chrome. Keep an eye on that date. That's quite an important date. Um, so Google produces Chrome. So these are your gangs. This is like laying out the, the turf where we're going to have the war. 
So what does the tech look like? Well, the tech looks like this. For about the first bunch of time, um, all you had was HTTP, HTML, and then cookies came along a couple of years into that. We need some kind of client-side state because HTTP is stateless. Request, response, forget. Request, response, forget. Uh, so we had cookies. SSL, that's interesting data point. That means people are starting to use the web for things that they want to be secure. OK, that's handy. That might mean that business is happening on it. And then JavaScript came along in that time as well, which was a way of doing stuff in the browser. You'll notice that my slides tend to be a tiny bit more Spartan than, than Scott's slides. Otherwise, I'd have an animated GIF in here doing cool JavaScript stuff. <laughs> so you have to imagine that. 1996, the browser gets Java applets, Flash, and XML. 1996 was a bad year for the browser. <laughs> um, that's, that's a, thank you. That's a horrible thing to have happen to anybody. Um, so now, 1987, HTML4 happens. CSS happens. This is interesting. People are starting to take the browser now seriously. They're saying, well, stuff's coming down to your browser. We should be separating content from styling. And you know, the web designers have been saying this for about five years, and no one's been listening because they're web designers. Um, but, see, but this is an important, uh, like the fact that CSS exists says we can talk about style independent of content. Oh, that's cool. 1999, uh, Ajax for the Dutch, or Ajax for everyone else. Um, XML HTTP request. Do you know where XML HTTP request came from? Microsoft. Even more so, Microsoft Outlook. Outlook did a good thing. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. So the Outlook web app, in fact. So the Outlook web app team. Uh, you're trying to use Outlook in the browser, and they realized that stuff, message stuff was going backwards and forwards, um, and that message stuff going backwards and forwards causing a page reload each time was just really sucky. So they came up with this idea of an, of an asynchronous HTTP request that you could fire off from JavaScript, and it would, you'd get an XML payload back. Um, and then basically for the next half a dozen years, we had graphics. <laughs> we had a few attempts at different kinds of graphics. This is my graphics care face. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not that guy. So let's carry on. So now 2008 to now, everything else, everything else that's interesting in the browser happened in the last four years. OK? Remember that date, 2008, Google comes out with the browser, starts shaking things up a bit. So you've got 2D and 3D graphics transformations and WebGL and CSS3, and this is still my graphics care face. OK, however, this is where I'm starting to get excited. Client-side storage, I can put proper stuff. I can have state that isn't just a cookie. I can, like, I've got a key value store on the, on the client side. That's pretty cool. Um, traditionally, it's I ask my browser to do something. Uh, it sends a request. The request comes back. That's how, the, that's how the mental model of the web has worked. We now have this idea of server sent events. So WebSockets, which is very, very high uh, density, um, full duplex I.O. So for each TCP packet, there are two bytes of overhead. It's incredibly efficient. Um, event source, which is a much simpler model, but it's, and it's like your asynchronous style. So like at home, your broadband is very, very slow up and very fast down, because that's where most of the stuff comes. You don't emit video that often. Uh, um, event source is the same model. It says, given that you're mostly pulling stuff down, it's, like, it's, it's the natural e extension of like, long polling. So here's your tech. And then ECMAScript, which is like JavaScript all grown up. Um, and Proper DOM manipulation and those kind of things. So all of these have happened in the, in the last four years. Um, so OK, so where was I? What have I been doing in that time? So I, my background is C and Unix and C++ and then Perl. Um, sadly, then Enterprise Java for a bunch of time. Um, so 1987, I went to college. I was there for four years. Um, and I was on Pyramid OS X, which was the, the proper OS X. OK, that's the real one. <laughs> I don't know what you kids are on. Um, it, was a, it was an early Unix. Um, I had things like Elm for sending email. I had Telnet and FTP for moving stuff around and logging into things. So this is the internet. The internet is still sending data around. It just wasn't sending data around as HTTP. So the internet is decades older than, than the web. And then for about, I don't know, a couple of years then, I was on Usenet. I was on CompLangC and CompUnix questions and CompUnix wizards and learning, learning, learning about stuff. So, so these, are, these are news groups. Uh, Usenet is like the precursor to uh, Stack Overflow, but with crappy graphics. And the way you gain karma is by answering loads of questions really helpfully and people getting to know who you are. It's crazy, but it seemed to work. 
1992, I remember this vividly, the first time I saw the web. So I saw the web, I was around my friend Phil Davis's house, and Phil Davis is a Unix guru dude, and, um, and he said, Dan, you've got to see this thing. It's the World Wide Web. And I said, what's that, Phil? And he says, look, and I've got a screen of text, and some things are underlined. And he says, that text is coming from a university, from like a college site. I said, okay. And he says, now look, I click on here, and now that's coming from a different college site. And I was like, oh. Oh, that's nice. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I was like, oh, oh. oops. Yeah. Uh, so I missed that one. <laughs> oh, I wish I could talk to me in 1992. <laughs> 997 was the first time I saw Enterprise Java. <laughs> and this guy at work, I was working at uh, uh, an ISP at the time, and, and we were doing cool stuff, and then Java had just come out, and then Enterprise Java came along. And this guy was raving about it, and said, I've got JDBC and JNDI, and, blah, blah. and I was like, um, meh. And, I, 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 you know, just saying, I was right. Um, so, <laughs> so. Missed one, got one. Um, so here's, here's some stuff I've learned. So this talk is, is some rules I've learned and a little bit of code showing some of that stuff. Um, so what's a browser for? OK, so my model of a browser up to mid zeros, OK. How do you, what's the right word, collective noun, for the first 10 years of the 2000, I don't know, noughties. Um, so uh, browser is for rendering J2E servlet output. That's what it's for at work. And at home, it's for displaying brochure websites, blink, marquee, tag, tag. OK, bing, 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 bing. Oh, magenta. Um, and suddenly, some stuff happened. And this, again, is my personal recollection of this stuff. Other things were going on. These are the things that I remember really landed for me. I was using a thing called StreetMap at the time, which was like, it was like little snippets of the A to Z of London, like basically like a street map. And you'd put in a postcode or whatever, and it would show you a little bit of, of the And it looked just like the A to Z map, but on your browser. It was kind of cool. And then Google Maps happened. And I was like, hang on, this is a draggy drag, drag. And I don't, know, I don't know if you remember the first time you clicked on Google Maps and dragged the mouse off the edge of the browser, and the thing kept going. How does it know? It's, it's <laughs> off the, how does it know? It can't see anymore. If your Google Maps looking out of the browser, the mouse is gone. OK? So I just thought that was magic. Um, so I'm using Hotmail and you know, sort of webmail clients. And then Google Mail comes along and just blows everyone else away. And you can see what's happening during this time is they, they're driving the technology forward. So Google Gears, which is proper client-side storage, occurred because Google, Maps is, uh, Google Mail is your mailbox, and they needed to put your mailbox somewhere. Yeah, so they came up with this technology. Google Docs. This is not a fanboy Google thing. I'll just come to this in a minute. Google Docs disrupts Microsoft Office. Everyone's using Microsoft Office, apart from the seven people who are trying to use Open Office for ethical reasons and hating it. Okay? <laughs> I, I was one of them. I, I, I still I love it as an idea. I just wish they would take all of the features out and make it work. Um, and what I'm thinking is this. They're not a search company. They're an ad company. For an ad company, they've got some really smart tech. Um, but OK, so here's what I learned. The first rule, the first thing I learned is everything is asynchronous. Our mental model of a browser is based on our mental model of a green screen, or certainly as developers. So on a green screen, I type something in. It goes off to the mainframe. The mainframe does some stuff, and I get a response, and I get output on my console. I type something into my URL, or I click on something in the browser. A request goes off, a response comes back, and it gets rendered. Okay. But that isn't what happens. And as long as we model it like that, we're, 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 we're going to fail. We're going to miss the point of it all. So everything's asynchronous. Um, when you send a request off, what happens is some stuff comes back. As soon as the browser can figure out what the other things are it's going to need, it sends off a bunch of other sim simultaneous requests and says, hey, I'm going to need that picture. I'm going to need that fav icon little thing in the corner. I'm going to need this, 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 and this. And they all come back, all kind of scattergun, different, you know, not in the sequence I asked for them. And I wait till I've got them all back, but and I render your page. And if I'm clever, I can be doing some preemptive rendering and, and space. There's some really clever stuff going on in browsers. OK. So everything is, is asynchronous. And so that means any kind of request response model is just selfish programming. So think of it in terms of a bar, OK? Because we, we had a, a beer-related talk this morning. It was quite fun. Uh, Adrian Cockcroft talking about um, bottlenecks, using beer bottles. Uh, um, so Here's what happens. It's in, a, in a British, I don't know if you guys, well, you've got a nearly British pub just down the road here. And you go in there, and I love that they act like a British pub, which is you have to go up to the counter, you wait, 
and then and eventually they say, what would you like? Oh, I'd like some beers, please. And they go off and they get the beers one at a time, then the next beer, then the next beer, and then eventually all your beers arrive, and then you hand them some money, and now you can go off. Okay? Go to an American bar, and this happens. You go in with your buddies and you sit down. You start your evening. A beer fairy comes over. <laughs> would you like some beers? Yes, I would like these five beers. Away goes the beer fairy. We carry on. We're not blocking. Okay? We're just carrying on talking. Sometime later, the bits, they might even come out of sequence. They might bring three of them and then two of them in a bit. Okay? And the three who, who have their beers, do they wait for the other two? No. <laughs> They're halfway through. <laughs> They're polling. Oh, hang on, I'll have another one of these. Um, so request response is just selfish programming. It kind of has the meta message, you can wait for me because I'm important. Okay? You've asked me to do this thing, you block there and I'll come back to you when I'm good and ready. Okay? So the corollary to that is that modal dialogues are rude. Anything that pops up and says, I know that the most important thing you need to be looking at right now is this, so I'm going to put it in your face. Okay? And the second corollary is that surprise modal dogs are, dialogues are even ruder. <laughs> oh, oh, luckily, <laughs> luckily, that's, that's only fake. Because <laughs> how irritating is that? Yeah? That was at, a, was at a conference last week in Cambridge, and that happened in the middle of a talk. And it happened in the middle of a talk by a UX designer, which I thought was desperately ironic and really unfortunate. And then the machine rebooted. <laughs> Thanks for knowing what's the most important thing for this machine to be doing right now for me. That's great. I'll just stand here and walk around for a bit, right, was, was how the next 10 minutes went. Um, so, OK, so here's a wild-ass theory I have. This is one of the peop reasons people like Node. People like Node and these single event loop models because you're not allowed to be rude in that way. Okay? The culture is don't be rude, is give me a callback or you know, respond to an event. Plus, um, I don't know if you've come across the acronym MINSWAN. It's from the early days of the Ruby community. Uh, it stands for Matt's is nice, so we are nice. Okay? It's about, so Matt's is the guy who invented Ruby and he's a nice guy, so that's why the Ruby community is nice. I'm extending it to RINSWAN, which is Ryan is nice. So we are nice. And Ryan Dahl's the guy that invented uh, Node. Um, but anyway, if you just assume you're not the most important thing, um, you're going to get somewhere. Right, I need to speed up because I've got tons of stuff to talk to you about. So I want to look at that response, the thing that came back. Server sends it to me uh, because you asked for it. I say, can I have this thing? Yes, you can. Or maybe just because it likes you. Yeah, I think you should have this thing. Um, but it's no use unless you can see it, OK? So the browser is going to render it for you. So what does it look like? It looks like this. Except this is not a page. This is not a page. What this is, is a big string, <laughs> okay, with lots of angle brackets in, that gets streamed over the wire into your browser. And once your browser gets all of the string and does all the stuff, it goes, ah, I can turn this into a page and render it for you. Okay. So what we're really doing is we're templating. Because this thing here is a little app I'm going to write. And it's a, a coffee shop. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not a coffee shop, it's a uh, venue guide. So I'm in our house and I want a venue guide. I want to know what good coffee shops are around here. So what do I do? I, I'm going to make a little um, app that is going to have lists of these coffee, coffee. There's only one in here at the moment. So you can see this UL is going to be a list of things. This LI here, this probably isn't in the template on the server. This was probably dropped in by some templating language. OK, so that's, that's what we did. So I just want to briefly talk about templating. So in J2E, again, this is my experience of this. We started with JSP, boo, hiss. Um, and then Velocity came along to make it all better. Hooray! And then Velocity became Turing complete and had macros and all sorts of crazy stuff. Boo, hiss. And then we had a string template, which was simple. Um, basically, all these things compile into a function that emits HTML. That's what they do. Then Ruby on Rails came along. And Ruby on Rails had ERB and mustache and partials and things. And they compile into a function that emits HTML. OK, great. But luckily, Django has the Django template system, which says two things. It says that the Python guys are doing the same thing and that the Django guys aren't very creative about naming things. And the Django templating system, guess what that does? It compiles into a function that makes HTML. OK. So what we do is, over the years and over the years, we try and get better at doing server-side rendering of HTML templates. OK. I think we're solving the wrong problem. OK. Um, we're doing the template and data combining thing to emit the HTML on the server, because that's where our, we assume the grunt power is, and that's where we assume all the information is, because we forget that what we have is a full, pretty much, operating system in the browser. Separation of concerns 101, right? How are we going to do this? So 
Here's the second thing I've learned, and it's made web development very different for me over the last few years. The DOM is the template. I can do stuff in the DOM. OK, let's have an example. This is the point at which I uh, put the, the, the Hanselman device on standby. OK, right. Uh, and let's see if this works. Da, da, da. So that's the first thing I want to do. And that's the second thing. How are we doing? Oh, hey, you can see me. Look at this. Right, git, check out x1. So I've done all my little steps and steps. OK, so, ah, so what have I got? I've got, by the way, just to show you how easy this is, I'm handicapping myself by using Windows. <laughs> all right? I'm using a DOS prompt. I'm using Notepad++. I'm using no fancy IDEs, tools, command line, trickery, anything. OK, that's how easy it is to get started with this stuff. So I have an index.html. So let's say start index.html. Ooh, there, look, that's my app. And we can view source on that app. And, and we can see. That's it, that, this, is my, this is my guide. OK, so this is what we're going to have. Now, let's assume this bit here. Is, can you see my mouse? Yeah, is that all working? Hurrah. Um, so this thing here is the bit I want to template, right? So this is for every single one of these, I want to put a, a, a list item in here. So what do I do? Well, uh, I'm, I, 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 I am not Scott. I will not stand here and type this for you. I'm going to cheat. OK, I'm going to do this. Phew, that's how fast I can type. <laughs> <laughs> because now I can go uh, like this. Oh, still looks the same. But what I have here now is this list item here, this li, is just a placeholder. Because down here, I have a new section. And the section has a special inline style. And I don't usually use inline styles, but this is a, an exception, where I say, I do not ever, ever, ever want this section to appear. So the display is to style is none, and that's important. That overrides anything else. And inside here, I dump little fragments of HTML. Okay? Now, by the time the DOM's loaded, that exists as an object in memory, in the, in the browser's memory. So what I can do is I can have a little function here called add summary item that I give it an item. And an item has a uh, URL and has a description. And what this thing is going to do is it's going to use a little bit of jQuery magic here. It's going to say, find the container, find the, find the URL that contains this thing, uh, and find that, that item template, find that li that was just floating around in that hidden section down there. Okay? Um, now what I'm going to do, and this is all jQuery, okay? This all pixies do this for me. I'm going to clone that item. I now have two copies of it, one of them floating around, not attached to anything, okay? That one that I've just cloned, I'm going to pop that on the end of the container. What that does is it gives me a new list item, okay? And then, uh, now that new item, I'm just going to drop some values into it. I'm going to find the thing that's got a class of URL and drop an href in. I'm going to find the thing that's called a, dot, a class description. I'm going to drop some text in. That's it, okay? So let's see if this works. Uh, down here, now, pew, pew. ha ha ha, thank you Microsoft thingy viewer. You can go down there. Thank you Scott for some excellent coaching last night. Okay, this is my browser, okay? And in my browser I can type add, ooh, right. I've got like, I've got an IDE here. I've got a REPL, I've got a thing that does autocomplete, okay? Inside Chrome. Inside Firefox, modern browsers have tooling in them. It's really exciting. So I'm going to add a summary item. Let's just uh, zoom back out again so you can see what's going on. OK, so here's Bob's Cafe. Add summary item. And I'm going to say uh, URL is martinfowler.com, who's just opened a coffee shop. And description is Martin's Coffee Shop. OK. Bam. Oh, look, how exciting is that? Now, you'll notice none of this is going on on a server anywhere. This is all inside the browser. Yeah? I'm, I'm manipulating the, t the, the... And for those of you who already do this, meh, right? For me, I was like, whoa, what? Hang on, so I can start doing this outside-in style development that I love to do without... I don't even need to be anywhere yet on a browser. OK, so, so I'm like, I'm pretty excited by that. Let me just... See where I'm going next. Okay, so uh, right, let's leave that for a minute, and let's go back to uh, our world of Dan and, and PowerPoint. Pew, 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 pew. And and we're back. Right, there's an example. So uh, 
Here's the thing, jQuery knows about DOMs, so you don't have to, okay? Everything about finding stuff in the DOM is just CSS selectors. You don't need to learn a new thing. If you know how to do the, the, the hash blah for, a, for a, a, an ID or a dot blah for a class, you can find stuff, okay? And jQuery lets you iterate over those things. It lets you group things. It lets you do all kinds of clever. It moves it around. And what you're doing now is you're manipulating an object graph. You're not sticking strings in other strings, okay? This is a really powerful thing to have in your back pocket. So the observation I've I have, and this is the one, if, if you take nothing else away from this talk, learn JavaScript, okay? Absolutely learn JavaScript. There are people who knock JavaScript. There are nasty, dark, dirty, dark corners of JavaScript. Don't use them, okay? Do enough CoffeeScript to know what good JavaScript looks like, then stop doing CoffeeScript. <laughs> that was my experience. I, I, I wrote a load of CoffeeScript, and then I decaffeinated it all. I, I turned it all back into regular JavaScript. Um, so, so where does that leave the server then? So now I've got my, and also something else uh, to bear in mind um, from the browser perspective, is if that stuff, if the page furniture, if the outline, if the template is coming now from the server, and I'm going to populate it with data, um, once I've got that, once HTTP kicks in and says, ah, 302, I don't need to send you all of that stuff every time you refresh this page. I can tell you that if you've already got it, it hasn't changed. So now I just send you the data. So you're making more performant things by doing less. How cool is that? So where does that leave the server? Serving data. It's not serving streams of strings with angle brackets in. It's just putting the stuff in there. Yeah? So that meant a new generation of app servers came along. Sinatra was the first one I saw in Ruby. It said, uh, you know all this stuff that Rails does? What if all you did, what if all you did as a web container was you get a URL and you send stuff back, and the stuff that goes back is mostly JSON? It's mostly just data over the wire, you know, or static content. What if it was just that? And so this tiny little thing called Sinatra came along and, and was that. Flask is a, is a similar thing in Python. It's a really small, um, fits in your head web container, okay? Uh, Joe Warns um, recently wrote a Java, serve, uh, Java web server. Who in their right mind in, t in 2012 would be writing a new Java web server? Surely that sort of solved problem. Yeah? No, because every single Java web server out there is a servlet container, is massively complifying sending data to people. Because that's what you want. You want HTTP in, stuff back. Okay? And the stuff back might be XML, might, might be JSON, might be some whatever it is. Uh, static content, but that's mostly what you want. The servlet thing, that's a, that's a uh, vestigial appendix, okay? Um, and then express and connect in the Node.js world. These are like these small little stacks that just do this stuff really well. Um, so that's where the server is. So that's my next rule, and it sounds really obvious, but it, it's incredibly liberating, okay? The server serves data. That's all it does. What does that mean? That means it can do it really, really well. It doesn't need to also be the thing that does templating and merging things together, and also the thing that does caching, and also the thing that does, oh, right? It can just be a server of data, which makes it a much simpler thing to reason about. Um, it's serving data, not serving objects, OK? Uh, and certainly not transfer objects. Transfer object is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as a transfer object. You transfer data. You transfer representations of things. Let's have an example. Invoking Hanselman. OK. Uh, pew, 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 pew. Right. So what happens next? Uh, next is, uh, just show you what's happened there, is I wrote a, a web server to serve up my, 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 my app. And here's my very complicated web server. Okay. I was going to pop it open in an editor, but I just realized it's probably not worth it. Um, <laughs> that's what it does. And it's even got a logging line in it that it doesn't need. <laughs> that, that's just so we can see what's going on. Now, I'm doing this in JavaScript. You can do this at home in Python and Ruby. It doesn't matter, because all you've got to do at that end is serve data. It doesn't need to be clever. Um, there's a lovely little tool called Always. Uh, always. And what always does is it starts a bit of JavaScript, and then every time it sees a file change that it depends on, it restarts it. So we'll be using that. So what does this mean? That means that now my browser, which is currently on file, blah, 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 if I go to 
local host 8080. Oh, this is so exciting. Oh, it's the same thing. Woo. OK, now, uh, this is good. And let's just see what the source is of this. Uh, OK, so this is still the same page. This is still a page with some static stuff in it and a function that if I was in the, I, the, the Chrome's REPL, um, I'd be able to uh, add things to it. Right, let's make it serve data. Let's make the server serve data. How do we do that? Guess what? We cheat. Right, so now, now uh, we are going to look at the code because you can see how much more complicated this has got now. It does all of that. Okay, so let me talk you through this. App.get slash summaries. Guess what that's about? That says when someone does a get on slash summaries, you should do this function. What does this function do? Well, let's see. Res is the response, so we're probably setting a header, and we're probably ending, and we're probably sending some stringified JSON of a data structure. One of the things that I've noticed with this style of programming is, and, and again, this isn't about Node or JavaScript particularly, this is like in Python as well, is the code I look at on the server side now is about solving the problem. There's almost no code on the server side that's about all the plumbing and infrastructure and wiring, and all of that nonsense has gone away because the server just serves data. That's all it's doing. And again, it's like it's, it's so obvious that it's, I know, it hit me like a face palm. But so now it does this. Um, and then let's also have a look in, while we're here, let's have a look in the, uh, oh, I've moved things into static now so we can serve them up. There we go. Let's have a look at my index.html. Uh, come on, there we go. So my index.html, I've added a couple of functions here. I've added a function here called set summaries which you give it a list of summaries, and guess what it does? It finds the uh, UL and it empties it, and then it iterates over the summaries and it drops each one in. So I give it a list of summaries and it will replace the summaries in there with the list of summaries. And this magic here, this dollar function uh, from jQuery, um, what this does is it says once the page is loaded, once we've got all the DOM there ready to monkey with, run this function. And this function says $.getJSON, says make a, make a get request, on slash URL, on, on slash summaries, and assume the thing coming back is JSON, and unpack the JSON and turn it into objects and hand it to me. Dollar dot get JSON. Talk about power to wait, blimey. Right? And then once you've got it, by the way, call set summaries with it. Yeah? So now it's going to, so this page is going to load, it's going to go off the server, it's going to, let's see what happens. So a five. Pew. Ooh. Oh, so now I've got this data. Well, let's take a look. Again, let's view source. Right? Let's see what's going on in here. Uh, oh, hang on. Where's my cafe, cafe, and cafe? Oh, it's not in there. Right. This thing here, this thing here is the current live DOM. Right? This thing here is just the stuff that loaded. You see how they're complete? They're not the same thing. One of them is the source of the page, but it's the instruction to the browser of how to assemble the page initially and give you a DOM. The other one is a live rendering of a DOM. So how do we see that thing? Well, we see that thing down here. Uh, and again, let's go like this. We see this thing down here. Now here, I can, and again, this isn't, this isn't unique to Chrome. Firefox does this as well. Uh, there's a reason I'm not mentioning Internet Explorer. Um, so now, in my summary, ah, right, here's my two summary items, and there's one of them, and there's the other one, okay? So this is live, okay, which is kind of cool. So now I can, oh, and also as I go over this, it highlights the bit I'm on. So th there's, there's tons of tooling in the browser that makes this really uh, nice and easy for me. Um, hooray. I think that was all I wanted to say about that. Uh, oh, no, okay, so th there was one other thing, which is if you look at this page now, this page which just fits on the screen is almost all JavaScript and <laughs> hardly any actual HTML. Yeah? So what I'm going to do is refactor that, because Martin's here, and that's what we do. Uh, oops. Oh, that's irritating. Uh, let's go control F1. Pew. CD. Users down. Up. There we go. Right. So uh, git checkout x5. Woo. OK, and then back into here. Right. So now I've pulled this summary out into a summary.js. What I tend to do is all the stuff that actually interacts with things, I still leave in the page, because then you see that page, and you can see what's going to happen with it as soon as you've loaded it. But all the functions that do things, they're off in, they're off in little source files. OK. And we can look in summary.js. It's the same. It's, it's just that other guy. So that's the only change there. Um, but now you can start to see how this app is going to evolve. The app is going to evolve such that the template, the outline, all of that stuff is going to be in HTML. It's going to be in clean, clean well-marked-up 
uh, semantically rich HTML. Uh, HTML5 gives you things like sections and, and, and useful words rather than just div, 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 div. Uh, um, any client-side behavior is going to be in little JavaScript files. In my instance, any server-side behavior is also going to be in little JavaScript files. If I discover that the stuff that's coming over the wire, I'm doing loads of JavaScript manipulation before I give it to the DOM, maybe I could just move that straight back to the server and have it do that before it sends it me. I can, make that, I can defer that decision if I've got the same technology on both sides. So that's a nice thing. Um, so let's go back to pew, pew. here. Uh, yeah, right, server seven data, not data. Right, let's have an example. So, JSON, JavaScript object notation? No. It's JavaScript structured data notation, which doesn't roll off the tongue as well. Okay? But it isn't objects. Get over objects. You're sending data around. Um, okay. So, how are we doing? It still looks a bit 1999. Let me show you. Oh, you can't see that for now. It still looks a bit 1999. So, remember I said I was rubbish at design. Right? Uh, I, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how rubbish I am at design. Um, so, back to here. And just to really rub salt into this, oops, just to really rub salt into this, so this is already my fairly ugly web page. Okay? I'm going to add a form. I'm going to add a little form that allows you to, add, to create a new uh, venue summary. Okay? Um, so, I'm going to do that by doing checking out version 5, like this. And I reload this page. How sexy is that? How do you like them square borders and stupid things and stuff and whatever? Okay, this is this is how almost all of my web apps have ever looked. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Okay, luckily some very very smart people at Twitter are that guy, and they open sourced a thing called Bootstrap. Now it's not the only one of its kind again, but it's the one I find by far the easiest. And what they have is designers. And what designers do, it's not about gradient fills and curve. But what they understand is balance. So they understand which fonts look good together. They understand what proportion of small, small should be, compared to a standard size font. They understand how to line things up in a way that makes sense to the eye, uh, because that's a whole other domain that, I'm not, that I don't have an expertise in. So I fake it. And what I'm going to do is this. View source on here. Okay. So I want you to look at this and remember it. Okay. Actually, I don't. That's fine. Um, but now I'm going to do a one. I'm going to make a one-line change. Okay. Watch uh, that. Pew, do you see that? That one-line change here. Okay. That's the line. Line five. I added a single style sheet. Now. Whoa. I mean, it's still not great, but whoa. Okay. Now, so this, the only markup on here is, so this is, where is it, h1, small. I've just said it's small. And uh, Bootstrap has said, ah, I know what small means. Small means I'm going to make it a smaller font. I'm going to keep the same width. And there's a conversation about kerning we can have. Um, and I'm going to gray it slightly, but I'm going to gray it the right amount so it looks like, wow. I don't even know how to start processing that. What I do know is that I write the word small, and that happens. <laughs> OK, and I, I'm down with that. But there's lots of subtle stuff as well. So, um, so th this label is for an area. Now, look, see that lovely blue glow? Ooh. Ooh. i do that again. Ooh. Okay, it's gorgeous. And that blue complements that blue. I've done nothing on this about coloring on this at all. It turns out that this blue is in the same part of the eye range that looks uh, sympathetic with this blue. And the mouse over blue, the slightly darker blue, again, is all part of the same palette. So they've come up with a palette of colors that work together. Okay. I don't even know how to tell you how cool that is. Um, and also, you can, it's all up for grabs. So really, you don't want a whole bunch of sites that all look exactly the same. Um, but what you can do is they give you the hooks. So this isn't written in CSS. This is written in a superset of CSS called Less, which is kind of it's structured. It allows you to do hierarchical stuff. Um, and it has variables and really simple extensions to CSS that make it more usable. And what Bootstrap has done, or what Twitter's done very cleverly with Bootstrap, is they've given you the hooks at the top, so typically just variables and, and values that you can change, that mean that you can create a still completely self-consistent different color scheme, or different styling, or different layout. So, and this is, so remember, all I did was this one line change. Now, when I'm designing apps like this, I typically have the jQuery API open in one browser tab. I have Bootstrap open in one or two other uh, 
tabs. I typically have underscore, which is a lovely functional programming E-type um, library for JavaScript. So I have a bunch of things open. And after you've been using this for about five minutes, there's a bunch of little things that you pick up. So I'm just going to show you. With and, and when I was putting this together, it took me less than 10 minutes to make it go from here to what you're about to see. Uh, just, uh, eight. And again, before I do that, I'll just show you the, 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 the source, what happened here. So what did I do? That my form, this, the, the, label, the, the label and the input are still here. Um, but what I've done is I've wrapped, uh, I've wrapped the label and the input in a div called control group. So now Bootstrap knows that these two things are related. They're part of the same control. And I've told it that the, this one's the control label, and I've told it that this one is the, oh, I didn't tell it that one was the other thing. Uh, but basically, control group and control label are all you need. It also has this concept of a well. Now, a well is it's just an area that's kind of slightly recessed. It's, it's not obviously it's, your screen's flat, but it looks like it's slightly recessed. They haven't quite got that working yet. Um, but so these are the kind of things I did. And what it turned out looking like after about five minutes is that. And I'm like, that looks pretty respectable. But there's lots of subtle things going on there that are pretty respectable. So not only do I still have my lovely blue glow, but you'll notice that these are lined up. These guys here are uh, right justified. OK, so that gives you a nice line in the eye here. There's a, like a, a, an indenting from here. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a margin here and a margin on the left. And then in this inner well, which you can just see because there's a tiny visual cue with the line. Yeah, it's not a big solid line, but it's not, not there. Um, has the same indent and the same, and the same drop. Uh, it's just the whole thing is put together really aesthetically nicely. And you get this for not quite free, but for really, really close to free. And so these sort of things allow me to move forward. And, and I guess this is probably the theme of the whole thing, is I've never felt so empowered right, to just write apps and just go. And I feel like I'm in control of the whole stack. There's not stuff that escapes me. Whereas, uh, I don't know, using just sort of rich desktop clients, there's so much stuff. And I've been using, I, I, I used Swing in Anger for many years. There's a ton of stuff I don't know about Swing, OK? I speak to .NET guys who, are, who have a similar experience with, with C Sharp. Um, OK, that's all I wanted to show you with that. So, phew. back to here and here. Right, so Bootstrap knows about styling, so you don't have to. So, um, so there's a theme here, right? And the theme is rule four, which is someone's already solved it. Whatever it is yeah, you're about to try and do with web apps, you enterprise folks, Right? Other people have already solved it, which is fantastic. Because <laughs> it means you can focus on the problems you're trying to solve. And it means a little bit of Googling, and a little bit of Stack Overflow, and a little bit of mail lists, and all the answers are there. And also, it has to be said, for open source, the docs to these things that I'm describing are spectacular. I mean, really, really like tutorials. Uh, I mean, just the official docs are like the you know, tutorials and API reference and all that stuff is really rich. And then there's tons of blog posts and stuff getting started. So someone already solved the DOM, right? jQuery. jQuery solves the DOM. It means I can, it means I can control it. Uh, Sizzle is the subset of that. Uh, John Resick pulled out the subset of that, which is the, uh, the CSS selector part. So if all I want to do is grab bits of, of DOM and do stuff with them in JavaScript, and I don't need any jQuery for anything else, I can just use Sizzle, which is tiny. Zepto is a similar thing. So it's jQuery flavored, but it's much smaller, and it's designed for mobile devices. Um, I didn't even talk about like data binding. Data binding is, again, spectacularly easy. There's lots of models for this. There's knockout, which is more your traditional data binding. You tag each of the things that you want to be data bound into some JavaScript code, and there's callbacks and that kind of stuff. Uh, backbone is a bit more inside out. So you start with the data and essentially sort of bind outwards from that, uh, um, which is great if you're going to be putting a, an app on multiple different platforms. Because your, 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 your view model, if you like, the, the model of the stuff in the, in the client side is the same on all the devices, the rendering of it. Remember the template's different because we're templating? Well, the template in one is going to be a DOM, the template in another is going to be a different thing on a mobile device. Say. Uh, Angular, messes, Angular goes one step further. Angular says, imagine the DOM was the, the, the well, given that the DOM is the interface, it's a bit crappy. It's a bit missing of certain affordances that would make it a really good. Uh, event source, for instance. Um, so what we're going to do is you, 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 have your, you load your page, you have some Angular code, and Angular effectively pre-processes your DOM into another DOM 
which has all these things hanging off it, and that's what gets rendered. Um, I haven't fit it in my head yet, but I think it's quite clever. JavaScript, OK. So everyone bashes on JavaScript. Oh, it doesn't do this, and it doesn't do that, and it's different in all the different. OK, that's true, until you use something like underscore. If I use something like underscore, all of my, anything that's sequency, so, so maps as a sequence of key value pairs, or lists as just a sequence of, of elements, um, I can use all of the functional affordances on like, uh, I've got map, I've got reduce, I've got inject, I've got all, all of those things. Uh, so, so uh, and, and zip and, and all these things are just are built into underscore. So it gives me a uniformity, so I don't need to worry. And again, enterprise software, okay? I'm not designing for people running IE7 or whatever. We just simply say, we're using Chrome, we're using Firefox, we'll test for those. And, and if you're not using those, then, then you can't use our apps. And that actually works pretty well in the enterprise as long as people see what they're getting. They go, oh, well, actually, if, if that means that we can get this stuff this much faster, this much better quality, yeah, sure, we'll have that. And we've found a really, uh, I find it's been very easy to get the adoption for that. Um, what else? CSS. Well, we've got Bootstrap, but that's, you know, that's one of many. There's Skeleton, there's, uh, again, uh, uh, Scott was telling me about 960 Grid. Um, so 960 Grid's name came from, comes from the idea that if you model a screen that's 960 pixels wide, then it's, mu it's really easy to think in terms of like quarters or fifths or, or sixths or whatever. It divide, 960 divides by loads of stuff. So it means you can have sixteenths of a page and they all look the same. So it's a good grid size to use. And Bootstrap took that idea and they said, okay, we'll have a 960 grid, but we'll make it really easy to do chunks of it. So things I didn't talk about, and I'm nearly out of time, but these are the things I knew I wasn't going to get to talk about, so I thought I'd mention them anyway. I didn't talk about URLs and history. So there's a lovely model in HTML5 in modern browsers where when you change the hash, um, you get an event fired. Okay? So the hash is purely client-side. So I can, as I'm clicking around and changing page state, I can be updating the hash. Okay? And that means I can take that link, mail it to someone, they can click on the link, the page can load, it can look at what its hash value is, and it can go, ah, you need to be over here with all these things. So each change in page state is still trackable. And the great thing with the history API is I can move back and forwards through those hash changes. And you can do other stuff as well. So now think about this. Think about if in your code you fire a hash change, you change the location to say, ah, I want to change this hash value, that itself will fire a hash change event, which causes a cascade of stuff. So you can make your page update itself from within itself. There's really cool um, event source and sync stuff you can do. Didn't talk the browser as an ID. I mentioned, I mentioned, just talk really briefly about some of the things you can do with Chrome um, and, and Firefox. They are staggeringly powerful. I can look at CSS live in the page. I can change CSS values and see what happens if I change margin sizes and colors and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not just a, um, a rendering engine anymore. Okay. Um, the community I kind of mentioned, uh, I've never seen more friendly people. Okay? Everywhere I go in the HTML5 world, whether it's the, you know, the V8 guys doing the hardcore C++ micro tuning, or the Node.js guys, or you know, folks like Leo Veru and all the sort of CSS army out there who, who they, they don't want to show you how clever they are, they want you to design great websites. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> They're on your side. Um, and I mentioned again, if you have JavaScript front and back end, then you can move stuff around. But this is a really powerful model. It's a really powerful programming model. So, uh, so what have I learned? What have I learned? Um, so the first thing, I guess, the DOM is a template. Okay? Use it like a template. Learn to use it like a template. Suddenly, loads of things become possible. Everything's an event. Okay? Everything's asynchronous. Everything's an event. You receive events. You process events. I mean, uh, Mar Martin Fowler, who's sitting at the front here, was, was talking about uh, the idea of event sources and event syncs um, about a million years ago. You know, we're, we're just catching up, right? Everything is an event source, and everything is an event sync. And if you model your world in that way, then you've got things like replay and rollback and all these kind of things you almost get for free. And it turns out that the JavaScript single event loop world lends itself really well to that kind of model. Um, you can work truly outside in. You saw how far into this thing I got without even needing a server yet, without even needing to serve the page from a server yet. Right? You can get a long way just by tinkering in the, in, in the browser. Um, and the thing I like, it pays to be late to the party. Because I come along and everyone's done everything. Uh, how do I solve this hard problem? Type, type. 
ah, okay, I just copy that thing into there and they use this thing and it all works. So that's great, thank you. Um, so that's it, go code web apps. Um, <laughs> thank you. I've, have I got a minute for questions? No, it's coffee time. Go get coffee. <laughs> Thanks.